As the summer came to an end in early September 1944, the United States Army raced across northern France toward the German border. Following the breakout from the Normandy beachhead, General George Patton's men fought desperately for over a month in the Lorraine region of France. The front line in Lorraine ran from Nancy to Thienville along the Moselle River. To prepare for an advance on the Saar, the Americans attempted to establish bridgeheads across the Moselle in weak areas of German defense. Despite a narrow defensive line, Germany repelled the majority of American probing attempts to cross the river on September 5th and 6th. Following these successes, Colonel General Otto von Nobelsdorf, commander of the First Army, felt confident enough to launch a counteroffensive against the stalled American forces. He intended to deploy Colonel Franz Bacca's 106th Panzer Brigade to confront Major General Raymond McLean's 90th Division, positioned on the extreme left flank of the Third Army. Noblesdorf was certain that launching an armored strike against the vulnerable flank of the U.S. 90th Infantry Division would induce sufficient chaos, potentially leading their units to collapse and flee. Hitler agreed with this plan, but placed a restriction on the 106th, limiting its usage to a mere 48 hours with strict orders. Both Noblesdorf and Bacca were seasoned officers, having amassed considerable experience in the East. Their confidence stemmed from the belief that delivering an armored strike on the vulnerable flank and executing deep infiltrations within the American ranks would sow enough panic to prompt their units to collapse and run, much like the Russians tended to do in similar situations. Panzer Brigade 106 was a small but formidable formation. Its main strength was a Panzer Battalion consisting of three companies of Panther tanks and one company of Jag Panzer IV tank destroyers, which mounted the Panther's powerful 75mm high-velocity gun in a turretless chassis. On that fateful day, the unit boasted an arsenal comprising 36 Panther tanks, 11 Jag Panzer IVs, and 119 half-tracks of various models. In addition to the unit's own Panzer Grenadiers accompanying the tanks, infantry from the 59th Folks Grenadier Division also reinforced the brigade, riding alongside them on the vehicles. The German attack was directed toward the American 90th Infantry Division, a part of the 20th Corps. The 90th ID also had numerous critical attachments to help it fight. The 712th Tank Battalion joined the division at the end of June and was fully integrated into unit operations by September. The 712th was made up of four tank companies, three used the medium M4 Sherman tank, while the fourth used the light M5A1 Stewart. The German attack began with a faltering pace. Bacca split his forces into two columns of approximately battalion size each, positioned at Auden le Roman. The first column advanced northeast toward Landry's, while the second column turned southeast heading towards Trill. There had been no prior reconnaissance, and the Germans had no idea where the American positions were, with just a vague set of objectives. Bacca relied on speed and local combat strength to secure victory, much as he had done in the Eastern Front. By nightfall on September 7th, the U.S. 90th Division had assumed defensive positions. Its three regiments established a line, with the 359th Infantry stationed in the north near the village of Zivri Surcourt, and the 358th Infantry positioned around the village of Mary. Due to the division command post proximity to the front lines, Company A of the 712th Tank Battalion stationed Sherman tanks around both command posts for added security. McLean and his troops remained unaware that a reinforced German Panzer Brigade was preparing to launch an attack on their positions. With a lack of intelligence, the Germans were similarly unaware of the specific locations of the American positions having only a general sense of their objectives. 
Colonel Baca's group commenced their advance along the road network from Auden Laroman towards Mary. The initial advance consisted of four or five Panthers led by Senior Lieutenant Strook, followed by a platoon of half-tracks under the command of Senior Lieutenant Papke. The remaining Stas Gruppe followed suit, with Baca and his headquarters company trailing just behind the leading elements. Not far from the road, the tank crews of Company A from the 712th Battalion quietly positioned themselves on either side, observing the column passing through. It didn't take long for them to recognize that it was indeed a German column. Second Lieutenant Harry Bell led three M4 tanks, stationed to protect the division's command post. Peering into the dim distance at the approaching German column, he quickly radioed the enemy's position to the commander of Company A. With precision, the gunner positioned on one of the M4 tanks, guarding the artillery command post, activated the foot pedal serving as the trigger for the Sherman tank's main gun. The cannon resounded with a boom, briefly illuminating the night with its muzzle flash as the round slammed into a German half-track position at the rear of the column. The vehicle caught fire, lighting up the area, and unfortunately exposing the position of the tank responsible for its destruction. Responding swiftly, several Panthers fired at the Sherman, causing it to explode and sending lethal metal fragments into the artillery command post, causing casualties among the men present. Close by, a Sherman driver started the tank's engine, attracting the notice of another Panther crew. The Panther fired its first round, striking the American tank's suspension. Meanwhile, on a different Sherman, Gunner Sergeant George Colton accurately fired an armor-piercing round, directly into one of the Panthers, causing it to erupt in flames mere moments before incoming German fire disabled his own tank. Colton climbed out of his damaged tank, swiftly reaching a nearby Sherman, where he assumed control of its cannon. Targeting a second Panther, he fired yet another armor-piercing round, resulting in two American and two German tanks ablaze. The glow from their flames intensified the illumination, aiding the gunners on both sides. The sporadic flashes from the muzzles contributed to the chaotic scene, and shortly thereafter, two additional Shermans erupted in flames. As the Americans attempted to form a defense, the Panzer Grenadiers disembarked from their half-tracks and launched an assault toward both command posts. Some of the half-tracks were equipped with triple 20mm cannons, positioning themselves at the flanks of the artillery command post and unleashing fire. They were supported by machine gun teams from the German infantry. Despite resistance from the American headquarters personnel, they suffered significant casualties under the intense attack. The GIs successfully fought off the initial assault, but a second attack occurred at 3.45 a.m., backed by Panthers, providing fire support for the infantry. Both sides exchanged grenade fire. Private George Briggs, seizing an opportunity, ascended an abandoned tank and operated its machine gun, sending bursts of fire at the Germans in the darkness. Under immense pressure, the divisional command post had to undergo a partial evacuation, relocating the main staff to the headquarters of the 359th Regiment. General McLean issued orders for reinforcements to enter the battle. The 2nd and 3rd Battalions of the 359th advanced from the north, accompanied by C Company of the 712th Tank Battalion. Baca split his shock group into smaller units to infiltrate through the American lines, inadvertently leading these groups to encounter other American units in the darkness. One of these groups collided with D Company of the 712th, south of the command posts. This particular battalion was equipped with the smaller M5A1 Stuart tanks and served as the battalion's light company. The unit later reported an enemy column comprising roughly five Panther tanks and six half-tracks, moving down a road positioned between the American tank companies. The column maneuvered around the 712th Battalion area and was thought to have been entirely eliminated or destroyed. 
Ray Griffin from C Company wasn't initially part of the firefight on the road. His platoon was sent to reinforce the artillery command post. Upon arrival, the tank crews concealed their M4 tanks with tree branches and awaited daylight. Griffin recalled, when it did get light enough to identify the tanks at the base of the hill as German, I directed my gunner, Bob Gladson, to aim our gun at the closest German tank. Our 75mm armor-piercing round ricocheted off. My loader Andy Rigo reloaded, and we fired again with no success. We fired three or four rounds of armor-piercing ammunition, but none caused any damage to the enemy tank. The German tankers spotted Griffin's tank and retaliated, hitting the M4, which caught fire. Fortunately, the entire crew managed to escape unharmed. Other tankers from C Company engaged the Germans more effectively. Don Knapp, commanding an M4 Sherman, witnessed a tank near his own being hit by a Panther, positioned approximately 2,000 yards away. Recognizing the Sherman's inability to effectively return fire from that range, they sought cover. Within minutes, Knapp's tank joined several others in positioning themselves in hull defilade, as he recalled. Then more tanks came down the hill, unaware of our presence. We engaged them, firing together. I believe we hit a panther, or someone did, and it caught fire. There was an explosion. As another German force neared service company after daybreak, Forrest Dixon, a maintenance officer, climbed into a Sherman undergoing repairs, lacking its engine, but powered by a battery. Concerned about protecting the battalion's vital ammunition and fuel present there, he felt compelled to take action. Most of the mechanics fled upon sighting the approaching German tanks, but one soldier stayed behind to assist Dixon in loading the 75mm gun. However, there was only one round available in the ready rack. Despite the Sherman having power, Dixon recognized that the turret's sight was likely misaligned with the barrel a situation known as boar sighting. Consequently, he opted to wait until the German tank drew closer, before taking any action. I kept it aimed at the lead tank, and when it approached about 50 yards from me, that's when he spotted me and started to turn his gun toward me, so I fired, Dixon recounted. He successfully disabled the Panther but had exhausted his ammunition. Taking quick action, he radioed Sam Adair, in charge of the 712's assault guns, Sherman's equipped with a 105mm howitzer instead of the 75mm gun. Adair and his team swiftly arrived, and upon seeing the approaching American reinforcements, the Germans surrendered. The Battle of the Command Posts unfolded as a chaotic clash, with armor and infantry dueling in the dark. Amidst this confusion, the Germans recognized that the situation was not unfolding as anticipated. Baca, a seasoned veteran with experience from the Eastern Front fighting the Soviets, had witnessed his enemies break and run when faced with a German panzer column penetrating their lines. However, in this Western theater, the American soldiers refused to retreat. Instead, Scattered groups of American troops regrouped and launched counterattacks. Although these offensives lacked coordination, the U.S. infantry relentlessly pressured the Germans, thwarting their attempts to regain momentum. Despite the intense confrontation, the 90th Division remained resolute and did not succumb to panic. The American infantry was equipped with various anti-tank weaponry and received close support from divisional tanks and artillery. Dispersed American tanks engaged the column, while infantry positioned themselves at road intersections to impede German advancement. Consequently, the Germans faced relentless harassment from tanks and endured continuous artillery bombardment. After an intense three-hour battle, the Germans started to withdraw. While one portion of the attack group managed to pull back, the other half, positioned in a sunken road west of Mary, faced targeted fire from U.S. artillery and was entirely obliterated. A battalion of the 359th Regiment, backed by tanks from the 712th, maneuvered around the Germans, effectively blocking their escape route. As a result, 
the entire column was nearly wiped out, with a loss of 7 Panthers and 48 half-tracks. As the deadly trap closed in around them, Baca struggled to maintain control over his units, desperate to escape. The landscape of villages and dense woods provided an ideal setting for the Americans, allowing them to effectively neutralize the powerful German tanks from close range. By the end of its first day in combat, Panzer Brigade 106 had been decisively defeated, losing the majority of its tanks and infantry in the process. The toll was significant, with at least 750 men killed or captured, among them numerous senior officers. The brigade suffered the permanent loss of 21 tanks and tank destroyers from the initial 47, alongside over 60 half-track carriers. This accounted for a three-quarter reduction in its combat capabilities, rendering the unit incapable of conducting any further offensive operations. It effectively ceased to exist as a functional combat unit. Despite Baca's experienced leadership, his brigade's attack failed due to poor execution. His inexperienced troops lacked the necessary expertise to conduct a successful offensive against a veteran U.S. division. The absence of inherent artillery support further diminished the unit's capabilities. Moreover, at the army level, German leadership overestimated the brigade's effectiveness and directed it into a poorly devised attack, capable at best of merely momentarily stalling the American advance. According to the 90 Divisions After Action Report, the German attackers seemed to stumble upon the command posts and appeared oblivious to the fact that they were engaging a rear echelon unit. The tank battalion's remarkable performance in the chaotic battle left a strong impression on General McLean, leading to the 712th earning the moniker Armored Fist of the 90th. Later in the war, when an armored division commander offered assistance by lending one of his combat commands, McLean declined, stating, No, thank you. I have the 712th Armored Division, 